death. Here we have the three characters of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And Jesus, at the beginning of chapter 11, gets word that Lazarus is sick. Um, the narrator also tells us that Mary is the one who anointed Jesus. <coughs> Apparently an allusion to something that we should know. And there are stories about um, uh, a woman anointing Jesus before his, uh, his death in um, uh, the Passion Narratives of the Synoptics, and also one uh, in chapter 7 of Luke of someone anointing Jesus uh, during his public ministry. Um, the gospel seems to be alluding to those. The woman is unnamed in all of those stories. And the, this gospel is identifying her with Mary of Bethany. Um, and sure enough, that story is going to be told in chapter 12. So in some ways, this is a prolepsis, uh, an allusion forward to something that's going to happen, even though it's framed as a recollection of something that everybody knows. And that's significant because uh, the story in chapter 12 is linked intimately with what goes on in chapter 11. And we're gonna come back to that linkage. Uh, Jesus comes to uh, Bethany after delaying a little bit, encounters Martha, and um, then has an encounter with Mary. So we have the diptych arrangements here. Then we have uh, the raising of Lazarus balanced with the reaction of the Jews and the Pharisees and uh, others. Um, and then a transition at the end. So that's the way the whole thing is structured. And uh, how do we get this to move on? Yes. Um, uh, this is obviously a major creation of the evangelist, this chapter, and it's built on um, previous materials of various sorts, accounts of resurrection events in uh, Jesus' ministry. We have uh, in Mark 5, the daughter of the head of a synagogue, uh, where the um, trope appears that, uh, oh, she's just asleep. Um, she's not uh, dead. Um, something that uh, comes up again in the discussion about Lazarus. And then Jesus talking to the woman and saying, Talitha kum, uh, arise, young, young woman, uh, leading to great ecstasy on the part of everybody. So it's a, an emotion generating event as everything we find in chapter 11 is emotion generating too. And then we have the son of the widow of Nain in um, Luke 7, where Jesus, as he is in chapter 11 of, of John, is deeply moved um, and uh, has to tell people not to cry, even though he himself is getting into it in um, chapter 11, Jesus wept. Um, and we have a reaction to Jesus's action there in chapter uh, seven of Luke that reminds us of the reaction of the crowds who had been fed in chapter six, that here we have a great prophet who can raise the dead. So there's uh, material in the tradition uh, that John probably knew and probably used in crafting this particular story. Uh, and he crafts it with characters that we know from elsewhere, from Mary and Martha in Luke 10, who, uh, uh, whose story is told because they have different ways of reacting to Jesus. And there's a judgment about that. Um, and people debate uh, exactly what the balance is between those two and what kind of judgment is being made. Um, there's something similar, I think, going on here in chapters uh, 11 and 12, but it's not until chapter 12 that the um, emphasis on Mary takes place. And what that emphasis is, is worth thinking more about. Does Mary have the better part, as is said in Luke? Yeah, I think so. From the point of view of Johannine theology, she gets it in a way that Martha does not. But what she gets is rather different from what uh, uh, is being conveyed in the uh, Lucan story. Lazarus too is a character that we get in Luke, Luke chapter 16. Uh, Lazarus, uh, who has his uh, relationship with the rich guy uh, and who uh, at the end of the story elicits this uh, response that uh, uh, when the rich guy uh, wants someone to be sent to tell his brothers um, uh, the trouble he's in and uh, get them to save themselves by giving to the poor, etc. Uh, he's told, well, even if someone rises from the dead, people will not believe. So I think John crafts a story in which someone does rise from the dead. And are people going to believe even if they see that uh, resurrection, foreshadowing the reactions that are going to take place when Jesus uh, is not raised from the dead, but rises himself from the dead. So <clears throat> the issues here, there are some technical, somewhat trivial issues. Where's Bethany? Is it beyond the Jordan, as it is in chapter one? 
or is it near Jerusalem, as it is here in uh, chapter 11? 15 stadia, a couple of miles away. Is there one Bethany or two? Does it matter? Well, maybe, maybe not. Bethany does seem to serve as a bookend in some ways. The ministry of Jesus starts in a Bethany, and it, uh, the public ministry of Jesus concludes in a Bethany. So I think we have this framing device that we've seen elsewhere, as in Capernaum in chapter 6. Do Mary and Martha say the same thing? Well, they repeat one another. Martha and Mary both say, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Why is this repetition? I think it's to set them up as uh, being very similar, all right, but is there a difference? And I think the reader is invited to think about what that difference is. But what upsets Jesus? Why is he angered and disturbed? Um, the language of deep emotional upset is, is prominent here. Is he angry at Mary and, and or Martha for what they've said? Is he angry at the crowds? Is he angry and disturbed at simply because his friend has died? Is he angry and disturbed at himself because he took so long to get there and could have got there earlier and saved his friend? What's all this emotion going on? Hmm, uh, could worry about that. Uh, and then there's the relationship with Lazarus. People say, see how we loved him when they see him crying. Uh, is Lazarus possibly the beloved disciple? Some people have thought so. I don't for the reasons I've already explained, but some people have suggested so. He is a person that Jesus loved. And as everyone that gets resurrected from the dead, one might say. Now, why do we get this repetition? I don't know. Uh, the deeper theological issues are, uh, when does resurrection happen? Um, and here, the contrast between Martha and Jesus is important. Martha believes in resurrection on the last day, as do contemporary Pharisees and just about everybody who's a follower of Jesus. And as Jesus himself in this gospel has um, proposed that he would raise people up on the last day. We saw one of those uh, cases in chapter six. Some people, by the way, um, see that those references to a future resurrection are like the reference to the Eucharist in chapter uh, six, a secondary edition by someone who's trying to add an orthodox strand. No, I don't think so. I think they're part of what John wants people to know as tradition, but understand in the way that he wants to convey. Jesus, in any case, says, I am the resurrection. It happens in some sense now. Um, in what sense? Coming to belief, coming to a relationship with God through Christ, uh, coming to understand oneself in the light of that relationship, all of that can be understood as metaphorical resurrection. Uh, is that something totally new? No, I don't think so, because we have it in Pauline theology. In Romans 6, where he talks about uh, uh, being uh, sharing the death of Christ in baptism and walking then in newness of life, or in Colossians 2.12, probably by a disciple of Paul that makes it uh, uh, the connection even more explicit, um, uh, put to death in baptism and then raised again uh, in, uh, to new life. Uh, so I think what um, the fourth evangelist is doing is, is giving voice to uh, an insight that we find in other early Christian sources saying, yes, uh, the resurrection is something we hope for in the future, but it's something we experience now. And we experience it how? Um, by having this relationship with uh, that's going to be spoken about in the Last Supper discourses, uh, the relationship uh, with God in Christ and with one another through following the command of Christ to love. Uh, <clears throat> so we have um, uh, this going on in the chapter. And then we have also the ironic reaction of the Jerusalem leadership. Everyone's going to believe in him. They say Romans will come and destroy us. And Caiaphas, uh, rather cynically saying, uh, don't you reckon it's better for one to die than for the whole nation to be destroyed? Um, there's a philosophical discourse that's at work here, and Caiaphas is being put on the wrong, wrong end of the good philosophical spectrum, uh, because being uh, the ex uh, expedient person that he is, is not uh, grasping true value and true morality, I think a philosopher would say. And so there's a certain amount of, uh, of irony here, but also a certain amount of irony because Caiaphas is acting as a prophet. Uh, what he says is true at a deeper level, the level that John wants to affirm, and Caiaphas is uttering a truth that he does not 
to know or understand when he utters this cynical remark that uh, we have to um, get rid of this guy. Okay, a couple of um, works of art to conclude. Um, this is a reliquary or casket from Brescia in Italy from the late fourth century. And it's a marvelous uh, little piece. It has all sorts of scenes, several of them from the Gospel of John. It has a, uh, an interesting scene of the, uh, the Good Shepherd, by the way. But here uh, are two scenes from the Gospel of John, uh, healing the man born blind uh, with the spittle uh, wiped on the eye. It could come from Mark, I suppose, but I think it's John, because the next uh, scene to the right in the middle panel here is uh, raising of Lazarus from, from the tomb, Lazarus looking like a little uh, doll, but that's uh, perspective, I think we're supposed to understand. Uh, and there, then, of course, there's Caravaggio uh, in the 17th century with his uh, somewhat outrageous um, uh, portrait of the uh, resurrection of Lazarus. It is said that he had someone dig up a corpse uh, and uh, bring it in so he could uh, record what it would look like. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's a story that's told about this um, painting in Messina of uh, the Lazarus story. 